Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's uh, TPD webinar uh, by Dana Farber. Uh, so today we have two sets of speakers. We have uh, Professor James Duncan and also Holly Sutter and Wei Zhang uh, from the Broad Institute. So the first speakers will be uh, will be James, and James will be um, uh, talking about exploration of the drug efflux pump MDR1 in product resistance. Uh, James Duncan is an associate professor at Fox Chase Cancer Center in the Cancer Signaling and Epigenetics program. Uh, he received both of his undergraduate and graduate degrees at the, in the biochemistry from University of Western uh, Ontario and carried out his postdoctoral studies at the University of North Carolina. Uh, Duncan Lab specializes in functional proteomics, cell signaling pathways, and studying the role of protein kinases in the development of cancer and drug resistance. And uh, James has been applying mass spectrometry based approaches in studying uh, shotgun, including shotgun proteomics, fossil proteomics, and kinomics to study uh, cancer signaling for nearly 20 years. Uh, the Duncan's lab uh, proteomics studies have defined mechanism of drug action and resistance to variety of molecular targets, including products, and that would feature the, the story of today. Uh, very much looking forward to it, James, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, the slides all look good. Good, excellent. Thanks so much for uh, having me today in the um, this webinar. I'm very excited about this. So um, I'm a protein kinase person, but um, like today I'm gonna talk about protac resistance because we kind of stumbled upon this interestingly through some of our proteomics studies. So again, just a little bit of background. Um, it was a great introduction there, but our lab is very interested in drug resistance and understanding how uh, cancer cells um, remodel their proteome, kinome, fossil proteome in response to chronic exposure to therapies so that we can understand drug resistance. And our kind of standard workflow in our lab is really to take cancer cells, chronically expose them to therapies, kinase inhibitors, epigenetic inhibitors, chemotherapies we've done. And we use proteomic analysis and mass spectrometry, quantitative mass spectrometry, to then to try to understand what proteins are upregulated or downregulated and signaling pathways that are changed um, with the overall goal of really designing uh, combination therapies that can allow um, and provide more durable responses for cancer therapy. So today, I'm going to talk about our studies of taking this workflow and looking at Protax. And this is a recent study that was performed by very talented, um, the work here was performed by a very talented research associate in the lab, Alison Karimjek, as well as a postdoc in the lab, Carlos Herrera Matavis. And this is, again, uh, as noted in the title, looking at this drug efflux pump as a potential mechanism for protac resistance. So protacs are heterofunctional bifunctional molecules um, with uh, uh, one of the ends that binds to a protein of interest and the other end that recruits an E3 ligase that leads to the ubiquitination of the protein target and then substance proteasome degradation. So these protacs allow for um, the selective degradation of certain targets. And why that's interesting to our lab is um, there's been a rapid development of protax for a lot of these cancer proteins. In our lab, again, being interested in protein kinases, there's been a lot of development of targeted protax for BRAF oncogenes, KRAS, um, the MEK protein kinases, which I'll talk a little bit today, our studies on that, as well as EGFR, AKT, and just many, many are emerging. So this field is very rapid in terms of the development of these protax for a lot of these interesting um, oncogenes and uh, in particular our case kinases. But as with any targeted therapies, there are resistance uh, uh, mechanisms that emerge. And here I'm just highlighting three really great papers that came out over the last couple of years, which showed that one of the way that uh, um, cells can, cancer cells can acquire resistance to protax is through the repression of E3 ligase components. So this is uh, um, the components that are required for the actual recruitment and degradation of the protein. So in this case, you can have um, in the cerebellum degrader or VHL-based degraders, which are two different types of recruitment uh, um, uh, domains, you can see that if you reduce the cerebellum or VHL, you can acquire resistance, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so that is one of kind of the mechanisms that has emerged and is, is a very intriguing one for protax. Also, there has been resistance mutations that have been shown where you have a protax target, and if you have mutations for the binding site of your small molecule warhead end, again, then you prevent the binding of that protax to the target and you won't get the degradation. So those are kind of some of the uh, resistance mechanisms that had been shown earlier as we started to look at it, uh, uh, protax resistance in our lab. 
So again, coming back to our workflow and our uh, use of proteomics, we wanted to really look at, are there additional resistance mechanisms to protax and cancer that we can maybe exploit or, or observe using some of this unbiased proteomics techniques? So we were here gonna take cancer cell lines and expose them to two different degraders targeting two different targets. This case, we're using the BET protein degraders and the CDK9 degraders. We're gonna use our mass spectrometry, quantitative mass spectrometry, and then try to identify proteins that are upregulated or downregulated or pathways that are altered with the real idea of can we design um, therapies that we can use in combination to improve the durability, say, of these protac therapies. Um, so first, uh, um, what we did was we took, in this case, we look at the ovarian cancer cell on A1847, and we chronically exposed these cells to the protein, BET protein degrader, DBET6, or the CDK9 degrader, thal sns 32 and what we found is that as you chronically expose these and made these cells resistant, they reduce sensitivity to the drug, as we see in the shift in these IC50 curves, as well as we saw a reduction in the DC50, which is the dose of the protect that reduces the target by 50%. And you can see here with the DBAT6 resistant cells or the CDK9 resistant cells, you have less uh, um, degradation of your protein in those cells with the increasing concentration of the protac. And here's just showing you um, with the Western blots that we're seeing this DC50 um, shift with these, that they're becoming less sensitive to the degrader. So then next what we did was we take we took um, these chronically exposed cells and we looked at the resistant cells versus the parental cells using our, in this case, we looked at global proteomic analysis. So just total protein remodeling changes using quantitative label-free quantitation. And here I'm just showing you volcano plots looking at the resistant cell versus the parental of our DBET6, so the BET degrader or THAL-R, which we use the CDK9 degrader. And we're looking at proteins that are upregulated or downregulated. And we can see here right away that's interesting is that um, the overall proteome responses are quite similar between the CDK9 chronic exposure degrader or the, the, the uh, BET protein degraders, with R values approaching around 0.8. Uh, so we're seeing a very common type of response amongst these cells. Um, when we see the, uh, um, uh, when we look at these proteins that are upregulated, we look at the top 10 proteins that are upregulated uh, um, in the two different Integrated resistant cells relative to parental cells. And one thing that stood out immediately when we were doing our proteomic analysis was this protein called um, ABCB1 or MDR1, a multi drug resistance protein 1. And you can see here it's amongst the top 10 in both of these resistant cells. And you can see it's quite dramatically upregulated in the proteomics analysis. So, what ABCB1 is, or MDR1, is it functions as an efflux pump for various cancer agents. So, you see that it acts as a drug efflux pump. So these anti-cancer drugs are uh, uh, efflux from the cells, reducing the intracellular levels of these drugs. So basically causing resistance by um, effluxing of drugs. Importantly, the MDR1 proteins have been shown to bind large hydrophobic molecules like Protax. And this is a very interesting uh, piece of data that came from one of these great papers about Protax resistance from a cell reports paper. And what they showed was that um, ABCB1 or MDR1 is really the only gene identified in CRISPR activation studies that, to promote this resistance to the DBAT6 or Arvinus, really suggesting that um, Protax um, could be MDR1 substrates. So next we went and validated the mass spectrometry data and looked and we saw that, um, and again, here I'm just showing, we have another cell line that we chronically exposed called SOM159, which is a breast cancer cell line. And in this case, we exposed it to um, a, a VHL-based um, protac, um, whereas the um, DBAT6 and Thal were both Cerebron based So what we found was that, um, again, whether it was VHL or Cerebron protac-based uh, chronic exposure, we see a very strong increase in the expression levels of uh, ABCB1 as well at the protein level, we see a very strong uh, increase in the MDR1 protein levels here. Um, and again, just showing you here that we looked at immunofluorescence for MDR1 in these cells that have acquired resistance to um, the BET degraders or the CDK9 degrader. And then we're seeing very strong potent staining of the MDR1, um, again, also at the um, uh, membrane of the uh, cells. So next we wanted to look at the um, activity of the uh, MDR1 protein to see that in the cells that have become resistant to these proteins, do we see increased activity or drug efflux activity of MDR1? 
And we use a traditional rhodamine 123 efflux assay, which is a way, it's a substrate for MDR1. So it's a way that you can test whether or not you have alterations in, in the uh, efflux activity of MDR1. And what we found here, just looking, is that in our cells that were um, resistant to DBAT6 um, or MZ1 or thal R, we saw that um, we saw an increase in the uh, efflux of the MD1, uh, rhodamine 123, um, suggesting that we had increased drug efflux pump, uh, pump activity. Um, also, we looked at cerebellum target engagement assays in comparing the parental cells with the, um, the DBET6 um, resistant cells. And what we found was that um, there was less target cerebellum target engagement of DBET6 in our resistant cells than there was in our parental cells. As you can see here in this difference of the dose of the DBET6, looking at the engagement of the cerebellum sensor, suggesting that we have reduced intracellular protect levels in these de uh, degraded resistance cells. And we assume this is due to our increased pump activity, reflux pump activity. Next, we explored um, looking at the uh, potential mechanisms for this ABCB1 or MDR1 upregulation. And we did this in collaboration with the Joe, uh, Joe Testis lab here at Fox Chase, who's an expert in genomics. And we looked for, um, we performed fish analysis for ABCB1 in our degraded parental and degraded resistant cells. And what we found that it was that the DBET6 resistant and thal R cells had um, a very, uh, 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 or amplification of ABCB1. And we saw both that there was chromosomal amplification as well as you can see that there were some uh, double minutes or these extra chromosomal um, ABCB1s we were seeing in these cells. Um, for the SUM159 cells, we saw that there was an increase in polyploidy but we didn't see this amplification. So there, we are actually currently trying to uh, exploring currently what the mechanism for the um, ABCB1 MDR1 uh, regulation in these cells is. But for the A1847s with the DBS6 or thal, we're seeing very potent genomic amplification of ABCB1 as the mechanism for upregulation. Next, we wanted to determine whether um, blockade of MDR1 or ABCB1 could restore to greater activity. So one thing to note just is that the cell lines that we were using is that when we chronically expose these cells to the graders, we keep them in the drug. So the cell lines that we study, we chronically expose them to 500 nanomole of each of the protax. So they're chronically exposed. So here we're looking at, if you knock down ABCB1 in your parent cell, we see no effect. But in our resistant cells, we see a very dramatic effect on cell viability when we knock down ABCB1 because now we're blocking that pump and uh, allowing that uh, um, uh, protac to accumulate in the cells and get very potent effect on cell viability. Again, here we see that knockdown of ABCB1 can uh, promote degradation of our targets now. So in parental cells, um, ABCB1 has no effect, but again, because we have this elevated MDR1 drug efflux of our protax in our uh, resistant cells, when we get rid of it, we're now able to see that that protac can get rid of our target proteins and you see very strong um, degradation of our targets. This is also observed with small molecule inhibition um, using the uh, molecule Tarquidar is very selective uh, inhibitor for MDR1. And we can see that again here, that if you treat the um, DBET6 or degraded resistant cells, CDK9 or, or um, DBET6 or uh, MZ1 cells, that we get a very strong uh, sensitivity of these cells in terms of their effect on um, growth, cell viability. And again, when we look at the degrader activity in these cells, we see that um, inhibition of MDR1 with a small molecule can really, again, uh, increase your degrader activity or reestablish the degrader activity of these degraders and see loss of your um, target that you were looking at. Um, ne next, we looked at the idea of whether or not we could prevent this adaptive resistance. So we know that A1847s and some 159 cells, when we chronically expose them to these degraders, we saw that they were able to overcome this. And you can see this here that over time, and this is just looking at 14 day period, that we start to see that there's this emergence of resistant colonies um, with the single agent uh, DBET6 or the MZ1. And we can prevent this if we block the MDR1 uh, drug activity, drug efflux activity using Tarquinar. And what we found was that we could get a complete inhibition of these colonies. So we were seeing no surviving colonies doing this combination therapy. So we're currently exploring this now further to see if we continue on this treatment, will we eventually get the, any type of resistance to this combination um, of the, the bet degrader with the Tarek Budar. And finally, just to kind of look at this idea of the role of MDR1 in, in protac resistance, we took these SUM159 cells, which do not express MDR1, but um, upregulated following chronic therapy, 
And then we force the expression of the MDR1 in these cells. And you can see if you force and express um, um, MDR1 in these cells, we're able to establish resistant colonies um, to the MD1, where they're very sensitive in the parent cell. And that we can then um, inhibit MDR, if you inhibit MDR1 with Tariquidar, we can then um, block those resistant colonies from forming. So really just showing you that um, MDR1 uh, really plays a, a role in terms of the resistance to this degrader where we can force it to cause resistance and then block it to allow the cells to um, become sensitive again. Um, so just kind of looking further, we, we actually chronically expose a number of cancer cell lines to um, the degraders, the bet degraders. And one of the things we noted was that there were other cell lines where we saw when they acquired resistance and we look and we see, we see elevated MDR1 protein levels, and then they were sensitive to Tariquidar. And we tested, I think uh, we looked at around seven cell lines. It looks like about six out of the sevens that we tested when we chronically exposed them to the bet degraders, we saw that there was a um, increase in this MDR1 protein level following chronic exposure, really suggesting that the upregulation of MDR1 could be a common um, type of mechanism for some of these cells for um, inducing to uh, cause drug efflux of this protac and acquire resistance. However, one of the cell lines that I was mentioning, the six of the seven, uh, we weren't unable to generate resistance to, to the bet, the, uh, in this case, we're looking at MZ1 bet degrader. And what we found is when we chronically expose them, they still retain sensitivity. So there's a bit of a shift here, but nothing like we were seeing with other cell lines. And when we went to look at the ABCB1 and MDR1 levels, both at the protein level and in the RNA level, we didn't see an increase in MDR1. So we, we did this many times where we tried to chronically expose these cells. And this cell line is called MALT4. It's a T cell lymphoblastic leukemia. So this cell line, we were unable to induce MDR1. So it's potential that not all cells are going to upregulate up regulate MDR1. Um, and maybe some of these cell lines that don't upregulate MDR1 will maintain sensitivity to these great degraders, and you could get maybe a, a more uh, initial effect in terms of what they're degraders. So now we established that, there, that MDR1 could be involved in acquired resistance. So when we chronically expose these cancer cells, we see this upregulation of the MDR1. We wanted to look at whether or not there could be an intrinsic factor to this so in terms of resistance. So MDR1 is, and, uh, is frequently overexpressed in cancer. And I'm just showing you here, looking at the cancer cell aligning encyclopedia, looking at the expression of ABCB1 across the cancer cell lines. And we see that about 13% of um, all of the cancer cell lines overexpress ABCB1. But interestingly enough, when you start to look at the different cancers, certain types of cancers really seem to have high levels of this MDR1 or ABCB1. Um, looking at renal cell uh, carcinomas, colorectal cancer, liver, neuroblastomas, some leukemia. So it seems like there's very high levels of ABCB1 in a lot of these cancers. And also then we looked at the human protein atlas, which really looks at the level of MDR1 through immunohistochemistry. Um, and what, what uh, we saw with this when we did our analysis was that some cancers like liver cancers or colorectal cancers, they had very high levels of this MDR1, approximately 50% of the patient tumors show very high levels of this MDR1. You know, suggesting again that, you know, this MDR1 could play a role in resistance. If we know that it can be part of acquired resistance, these cells that have overexpressed levels could also be uh, potentially a resistance marker. One other thought just to think about is that um, it's been shown that MDR1 is upregulated in many of the chemotherapy resistant tumors. And this is where a lot of times we might think about starting with our targeted therapy. So it seems like MDR1 expression could be uh, important as a potential biomarker for response for these protacs. So we wanted to explore this further. So we took 10 cell lines from the cancer cell line encyclopedia, five that had overexpression of MDR or expressed MDR1 at high levels or moderate levels here, um, and then the cell lines that didn't have it. And we looked at, again, its response, uh, um, or the cell lines response to the um, CDK9 degrader thallus and SO32. And what we found was that the MDR1 expression could predict the sensitivity to CDK9 degraders. So you see cell lines that had the high level of MDR1 protein levels were less sensitive than the um, cell lines that did had low or non-detectable levels of MDR1. So next we looked at then um, whether or not this was due to the fact that we were not getting, uh, uh, or there was a difference in degrader activity amongst these uh, MDR1 low or high cells. And again, here we're just seeing that cell lines that do not have um, MDR1 expression, we see that there's a, a, um, you know, a nice degradation of CDK9 in these cells with the CDK9 degrader. However, in cell lines that have the MDR1 high levels, again, we were seeing that we were just not getting the same DC50s upwards of the high nanomole, uh, almost micromole levels in terms of this thalassin S32. 
032, again, suggesting that the high level of MDR1, um, this drug efflux activity could be important for um, determining whether you'll have uh, potent to greater activity or not in these cancer cell lines. So next then we, we look to see, um, like in our resistance or acquired resistance studies, if we knock out ABC or knock down ABCB1, in this case, we just use siRNA. If we knock down ABCB1 in this uh, um, MDR1 overexpressing cell line, could we reestablish the um, uh, degrader activity in the cells? And that's exactly what we see is that if you remove MDR1 from these overexpressing cells, you can then get nice DC50 values, similar to what we see with MDR1 low um, cell lines. And you can also do this with the inhibitor tyrocorder again. So both of them are really showing you that in MDR1 overexpressing cells, if you just block MDR1, you can reestablish this degrader activity and show that you have a, uh, a potent response. And again, looking back at the cerebellum engagement assays, target engagement assays, what we see is that um, we're getting more cerebellum uh, uh, sensor engagement now when we use Tariquidar in combination with our uh, CDK9 ProTac, suggesting that we're getting more intracellular levels of our um, CDK9 ProTac to engage the cerebellum sensor and really uh, um, maximize that degradation of our target using the uh, degrader. And then finally, what we see is that there's um, that MDR1 can uh, blockade can restore the sensitivity to these degraders. So we showed molecularly that um, overexpression can impact the DC50 of your degrader and that you can block it, uh, uh, MDR1 and get, you know, reestablish that degrader activity. Here's just showing you that using CDK9 or, or BET degraders, we can combine the drugs with a selective MDR1 inhibitor. Uh, of this case, the CDK9 or the DBET or the um, BET protein degraders and get very potent synergy. So you can establish this. So this could be a mechanism or a method for how you can, if you have MDR1 high level uh, um, in your uh, tumors or cells that you can combine with this uh, MDR selective inhibitor and then get your uh, desired degradation of your target and your effect on the, um, in this case, we're looking at the viability of these cells. However, um, Currently, there are actually no FDA-approved MDR1 selective inhibitors. A number in clinical trials suggesting that this, this idea of blocking MDR1 and with your degrader could be potentially something to look at in the clinic as well. But interestingly enough, as we were going through the work and, and, and kind of as we're kinase people too, uh, we started looking back at some of the literature and interesting enough, several kinase inhibitors have been shown to be uh, potent MDR1 inhibitors. Um, and more so that so, uh, a number of FDA-approved kinase inhibitors um, have been shown to have uh, MDR1 uh, um, inhibitory properties, uh, including RADO1 and lapatinib, so a very prevalently used uh, both drugs in terms of for anti-cancer therapeutics. So this kind of led us to think about it because, um, again, as we were a kinase-based lab and we were, we were very interested in understanding these kinase uh, pathways, could we use these FDA-approved dual MDR1 slash kinase inhibitors to prevent this resistance. And we would have a potential mechanism that we could use these approved molecules maybe to improve um, the degrader activity of uh, the different protocols that we're working with. And the other benefit to this again is that uh, um, mTOR and EGFR are frequently altered in cancer. So we see that there's a very potent, um, you know, this idea of polypharmacology, we could block both MDR1 drug efflux and target your kinase, oncogenic kinase. So we went through and we looked and we took an, an uh, um, MDR1 overexpressing cell line, DLD1, which is Coloretta line. And we showed that again, yes, that if we use this redamine efflux assay, that if we use RADO1 or lapatinib, so the mTOR inhibitor or EGFR, dual type inhibitor, we can actually inhibit similar to what we get with the TARC with our uh, um, mTOR, MDR1 selective inhibitor. I think importantly, what we see is that we're able to reestablish that DC50, uh, um, the degrader uh, um, effect here, shifting it where we can get um, now nanomolar degradation by combining um, the mTOR RADO1 inhibitor or lapatinib EGFR inhibitor with the degrader. And again, see, we can see that we're uh, um, getting that degradation of our target like we were seeing with the selective uh, MDR1 inhibitor. Um, and again, here we're seeing this drug syner synergy. So I think overall, it looks like, you know, yes, that we could potentially use these FDA approved molecules, lapatinib or RAD01 mTOR inhibitor um, to block MDR1 activity. So for why, so in our lab, we're actually quite interested in colorectal cancer and KRAS mutant colorectal cancer, as well as where lab is uh, currently studying MEK inhibitors and MEK degraders. So this became very interesting for us in terms of the um, herb receptors and lapatinib, because it's been shown that um, 
uh, blockade of um, or MEK inhibitors, so if you block MEK in, in KRAS mutant cell lines and colorectal cell lines, we see that we get a compensatory activation of the ERB receptors that then leads to the act reactivation of the RAS pathway as well as the piatric kinase AKT pathway. And you have to effectively block both EGFR and MEK to get effects in these uh, um, CRC, KRAS mutant cells. So we are intrigued and we hypothesized that potentially using lapatinib, so this FDA approved um, ERB receptor inhibitor, um, as a dual MDR1 and ERB receptor inhibitor could work very well with MEK degraders because we know that MEK degradation is going to lead to this activation of EGFR, and we know that resistance to MEK degraders could be MDR1 dependent. So we thought that this could be a cool part polypharmacological way to block both of these types of resistance mechanisms. So we started to explore um, in MDR1, ABCB1, and KRAS mutant colorectal cancer cell lines. And what we see again is that it's um, frequently overexpressed. So KRAS mutant can most, most of the cell lines have overexpression of, so DLD was the cell line we we're using as our, as our uh, um, uh, cell line to show that MDR1 is overexpressed. So you see very high levels. So again, we took and looked at, um, picked a bunch of these and looked at them and looked at their effect in terms of uh, their impact with MEK degrader. And this was done in collaboration with um, Zhenzhen from Mount Sinai provided us with this MEK degrader MS432. Uh, and again, what we see here is that MDR1 expression in colorectal KRAS mutants can predict the sensitivity to MEK degrader. So high levels here, these cell lines, we see that there's no impact with the MEK degrader in terms of viability of colony formation. But here we can see that there's the, the MDR1 low cell lines here that we have a nice effect. So then we wanna explore this further. So again, here, I'm just showing you a, one of the cell lines that was MDR1 colorectal cancer KRAS mutant line versus an MDR1 high. And again, showing that same principle uh, increasing concentrations of the MEK degrader, we see very nice degradation of our targets in the low uh, apoptosis in these KRAS mutant cells, but in our high cell lines, we're not seeing any impact here um, in terms of uh, apoptosis or effect on our, our MEK1 or 2. And then we're seeing that um, Tariquidar and Lapatinib, again, in this MDR1 overexpressing KRAS mutant line, we can block the drug efflux pump. And I think then what we looked at and compared was, is there a difference in terms of the degradation of the MEK1 and 2? And one thing that we did notice when we compared combining the MEK degrader with Tariquidar, so the selective MDR1 inhibitor or the dual herb with MDR1 inhibitor, was that we got um, better reductions in fossil ERK. So that was interesting, um, you know, whether or not there could be benefit from blocking that herb receptor in combination with the uh, um, MDR1 inhibitor. So we looked at this further and looked at the molecular response and looking at the feedback responses. But one thing that stood out immediately was, so when we combine the MEK degrader with Tariquidar in these cell lines, we can get very nice degradation now of our targets, MEK1 and 2. And that's what we hypothesized because we're blocking the pump and allowing the MEK protact to accumulate in cells. Um, however, we weren't getting really the apoptosis response and the effect that we were expecting from combining uh, um, that we would expect uh, with the inhibition. Um, however, when we do, when we combine the EGFR or the, the ERB receptor and MDR1 inhibitor lapatinib with the MEK degrader, we're seeing this very potent apoptotic response in these cells. And we are seeing an inhibition of our receptor tyrosine kinase, the ERB receptors, loss of our targets, and very strong loss of the inhibition or the, of the fossil ERK. But probably we're seeing the loss of AKT signaling here. So again, that idea that when you block the MEK, you, put a, you, you cause a feedback activation of ERB receptor and that drives both the reactivation of the RAS and the activation of AKT. By using lapatinib, we're able to block that and we're able to block the MDR1 efflux activity, allowing that MEK degrader to accumulate. So that's a very intriguing way to, to, to look at this as a polypharmacological way. And again, we're seeing this combination has very potent synergy when we combine the two. And, and as well as in other, so this is the one cell we're looking at. And in other KRAS mutant cell lines, we, again, we see this synergy by combining the MEK degrader with the EGFR inhibitor. And we were seeing, I don't have the data here, but we saw that the combination of MS-432 and lapatinib uh, was, uh, had more synergy or better synergy scores than using Tariquidar here. So finally, we wanted to look to see whether or not we could see this impact in uh, uh, tumor xenograft models of KRAS mutant colorectal cancers. And for these studies, we used uh, MS-934, which is another uh, MEK degrader that was provided to, uh, by Zhenzhen from Mount Sinai. And it, was, it has optimized bioavailability, so we utilized that. But what you can see in our tumor xenograft models using this MDR1 overexpressing cell line, 
was that single agents of the MAC degrader or EGFR by themselves really didn't have an impact. It was only when we put them together where we would see this kind of uh, enhanced degradation of MEC1 and 2 and loss of the ERK signal giving us this impact on uh, the tumors. Um, KRAS degraders as well. So, the, so there's been emergence of the KRAS G12C degraders. And in colorectal cancer, we're again interested in this. Um, ERB receptors are known to pr promote resistance to the um, KRAS inhibitors, the G12C inhibitors. Um, and you can see here, um, LC2 is a G12C degrader. And what we find is that the, the warhead uh, um, G12C inhibitor is actually very effective in these colorectal uh, MDR1 high cells, but the degrader isn't. And when we again look molecularly at this, we see that um, combining the KRAS G12C degrader with Tarequidar, we're able to get better degradation of KRAS, see some of our reductions in our pathways, but it's not until we use a little patinib with the G G12C degrader that we get our apoptosis, our loss of KRAS protein levels, but really strong reductions in our, our pathways downstream, and we're getting that drug synergy again between our KRAS G12C degrader and uh, the dual MDR1 slash herb receptor inhibitor, and we see here with the colony formation that um, we have a better response using lapatinib than just the MDR1 selective. And we think again, this is because when you inhibit MEC, I'll show you here. So when we inhibit MEC with MEC inhibitors or MEC degraders or KRAS G12C with the inhibitor or degraders, you're gonna induce activation of ERB receptors and then that'll reactivate these pathways. So you wanna block this. And this is where we think this in interesting concept of using lapatinib in combination with either the G12C degraders, uh, the KRAS G12C degraders or the MEC degraders, is that you get this polypharmacology, this dual inhibition of MDR1, which is a resistance for the MEC or KRAS degraders, where, and, and then lapatinib also can block this ERB receptor, which is key for the resistance to um, the uh, MEC uh, um, inhibitors or KRAS degraders. So just to wrap up here, um, there's still a lot of questions that we're trying to understand about the MDR1. So how common is MDR1 upregulation and acquired resistance? So we're currently expanding. So we looked at seven cell lines, but we know we need to look at further. So we've generated 20 degraded resistance cell lines to four different protacts, and we're now exploring the level of MDR1 in those to see how frequent we are seeing it. Um, we're trying to understand biomarkers. So in, in certain cells, you see upregulation of MDR1 and some you don't. Are there certain biomarkers if it's epigenetic, methylation, uh, different ways that we can look to try to understand that, as well as the mechanisms for MDR1 upregulation in this resistance. You know, uh, we showed gene amplification can be a way that the cells can induce the MDR1. Uh, we also showed in our recent publication uh, with uh, um, collaboration with Alfonso Bellicosa here, Fox Chase, that hypermethylation of the ABC pro promoter can be involved in this. And we're currently exploring signaling because there has been shown to be p kinase KRAS and EGFR links to this MDR1 expression. I think finally, what we're really interested in is, um, is MDR1 upregulation mutually exclusive with the ligase component loss? So when we, we see downregulation of some of these key components of our PROTAC recruitment uh, 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 components, do we see this as a cooperative thing or is it a mutual exclusive thing with MDR1? So we're currently taking that the, the cell lines that we've generated uh, resistance to, and we're looking now at um, different cerebron, VHL, call two, call four, some of these components to see whether or not there's a mutual exclusivity or a cooperative effect. And finally, just the last two points, um, you know, how will cancer cells acquire resistance to the M, uh, the uh, a combination of MDR1 plus PROTAC. And this could again lead to this idea that, you know, it could be that we're losing the E3 ligase components as well. So once we are able to effectively um, keep the protac in the cell but block an MDR1, the cell, cancer cells might downregulate some of these E3 ligase components uh, and causing resistance that way. And then finally, can we use lapatinib? So we're very intrigued by this polypharmacology of mTOR or MDR1 and um, herb receptor inhibitor lapatinib. Can we use this with other degraders? So and thinking about other cancers like herb driven cancers or EGFR mutant cancers, and then other cancers that have uh, reactivation of the receptor. Can we use this in combination? And I'll send there. I, I know I might have taken a couple, two minutes there. And just like to acknowledge my lab. Again, I was saying um, Allison and Carlos did such a great job on this paper. There are many other people involved in this study. Um, Alfonso, uh, Joe Testa, a number of groups, Jan Jan for the uh, uh, MEC degraders. And then this is just our funding. So with that, I'd like to say thanks again for having us. And we're excited to tell this story about Protax.
it's a pleasure to introduce our, our next speakers, um, Holly Satter and uh, Wei Zhang. Um, Holly Satter is a director of biochemistry and biophysics at the Center for the Development of Therapeutics, the CDOT, at the Broad Institute of MIT in Harvard. And her research unit supports projects across multiple therapeutics areas to identify, validate, and mechanistically characterize potential small molecule therapeutics. And has, her team has expertise in multiple techniques, including SPR, NMR, mass spectrometry, enzymology, uh, and others. Um, Dr. Satter has more than 15 years of experience in drug discovery and co-authored many uh, more than 20 scientific publications. Um, Holly has received her BA in chemistry from Hunter College and her master's and PhD from Clark University. Um, Wei, uh, Wei Zhang is a senior research scientist in the biochemistry and biophysics groups, the, the CDOT, at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And Dr. Zhang has been at the Broad for nearly a decade, working on many different projects in the CDOT portfolio. In 2019, she was recognized with the Broad Excellence Award with in extraordinary work related to the COVID pandemic for her contributions to rapidly establishing Broad's COVID testing capabilities. Uh, she received her um, BS in biochemistry from Nanjing University and her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Penn State University. I thank you, Wei, for all the COVID efforts. I think everybody can relate to that these days. Um, so um, Holly and Wei, uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Radek. Um, before Wei talks about her, her targeted protein degradation toolkit, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to tell you more about the Center for the Development of Therapeutics. Um, we are a drug discovery organization embedded within the Broad, and we sit at the interface between scientific researchers and our industrial partners that uh, fund the drug discovery projects within uh, the Center for the Development of Therapeutics. And the investigators are, are the ones that are really exploring and driving the discovery of novel targets and the biology around those targets and advancing the biological understanding throughout the drug discovery process. CDOT is staffed by professional scientists, and those scientists are responsible for executing the drug discovery projects, utilizing industry standard infrastructure and capabilities. And in the middle of the slide, you can see some of the capabilities that we've built uh, within CDOT. So we really work with the, the investigators from Broad and all of its affiliated institutions to uh, provide insights about the steps that are required to validate targets of interest from a drug discovery perspective, which is different perhaps than target validation from a mechanistic or biological perspective. And we work with those investigators to create a drug discovery plan around those, those potential targets. And then we help them identify funding sources, including working with one of our ongoing funding collaborators. Uh, we really create a mechanism for those PIs and their labs to actively participate as a key partner during the drug dis discovery process. And we really feel that's critical for the success of our projects. Um, and right now we, we currently have four major industry partners that I'm showing on this slide and each of those industry partners brings a complementary drug discovery capability. They also have strategic expertise and significant resources to accelerate our projects. And this model has been very successful. We've been able to license eight programs um, and an additional five programs have reached the clinic. Um, and we work across therapeutic areas. Uh, we work in psychiatric disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, uh, rare diseases and infectious diseases. And so at the bottom of this slide is an email that if you're interested in learning more about CDOT, CDOT or partnering with us around one of your projects, um, you can email cdot-collaborate at broadinstitute.org. 
Um, I th thank you for um, inviting us here and I'll turn it over to Wei to talk about her toolkit. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for, in, uh, for the invitation. I'm very glad to uh, share the in vitro toolkit that we built up at uh, CDOT uh, at the Broad Institute uh, that's targeting the uh, protein degradation uh, strategy. Um, so today I'm going to share the validation of uh, several tools as well as the transfer to our own project. Uh, so when we think about the experimental design to detect the formation of this uh, ternary complex, it is usually like this. this. In the middle is the bifunctional small molecule. On the left and the hand, right are the two proteins we want to bring them together. One is the uh, E3 ligase. It could be um, very many uh, different types of. And it, another is the targeted protein that we want to degradate. Um, so to, uh, to uh, characterize this uh, ternary system is not easy. The ones that we are more familiar with is the binary system. And therefore, if we can turn this ternary to a binary, things will be much cleaner and quantitative. So one way to do that is try to add a lot of protein on one end and to saturate the small molecule. And in this case, because we assume that there is no in direct interaction between those two proteins by themselves, and therefore we can just mirror the KD and the kinetics between the binary on the right hand and then the empty protein on the left hand, and then we can mirror the KD. The difference between the KD mirrored in this system compared to the binary system will be the cooperativity. So this is a very clean way to do the measurement but on the, in the reality, um, it requires the, um, the affinity to both end to be uh, reasonably tight. So for example, uh, submicromole or even lower. And then that is not always achievable. And therefore people build up a more uh, universal way to look at this system and they call it a hook effect. In this case, uh, they will have the two protein, empty protein at the beginning, not always, not necessary to be one-to-one -one equivalent, and then started to um, titrate the, comp uh, the, uh, the molecule into it. So at the beginning, it will become uh, like the formation of the ternary complex, just more and more, and it's keep going up. But at some point, this binary complex will all compete with the formation of this ternary complex, and therefore the ternary complex will decay. So this as a function of the compound uh, concentration, the formation and then the decay of this uh, uh, ternary complex is called the hook effect. In theory, you can extract the two variables from just the one curve, which looks to be nice. But if you have worked with the protag, you will possibly know that the protag usually have some limitations uh, at the high concentration. A lot of weird things could happen in solution. And therefore, it is also not easy to achieve this uh, ideal scenario. So the more practical approach is um, to do the simulation and then just overlay with the experimental data and see how well they agree to each other. And what methods, uh, in vitro methods, can be applied to the detection of the ternary complex? So I just listed a few, and apparently because this um, field is so popular, so the tool is, is growing. Um, the SPR and the BRI, that can that's is a yes for sure. The TR thread to detect the proximity uh, of the two units, and that is a yes. We also see literature recently apply the advanced mass spec and the NMR, and then to uh, detect that. Uh, ITC is a way that's often used, but I put a star here because it's only be used to detect a pseudo binary because it's only needed to, it has, the system has to be clean. Otherwise the heat exchange, it's difficult to say is it from the binary or ternary or combination of the two. Okay, so when we search the literature, um, we find this, um, the system VHL, BRD4, and the compound MZ1 is very commonly applied as a model system uh, to uh, validate all kinds of tools. So we also wanted to use that. Um, so we tried to uh, keep the condition as close as the reported uh, data, uh, but sometimes we also wanted to get a, 
uh, universal recipe, for example, like buffer components and although and the protein uh, construct. So therefore, although largely they are the same, but there's some technical details, uh, they are slightly different. All right, so first the thing is about the ITC. So the setup is just to follow what has been reported. Um, because the compound is limited in the solubility, so we keep the compound in the uh, cell and then the protein in the syringe to titrate it into the cell. In the binary, uh, we keep the VHL added to the compound. And in the ternary, we pre-incubate the compound to the BRD4 and then add a VHL to cell. Concentration keep the same. The middle panel is the publication and the right panel is what we find in house. So we can see that for majority of those parameters compared to the publication, it's uh, very similar, but except one thing, and that is the stoichiometry in the binary. So it confuses us a little at the beginning because the stoichiometry seems to be perfect fine in the ternary, but somehow it's just a drop to half in the binary. And we assume that is because of the poor solubility of this compound in the buffer that we applied. Because if you think you put a pump, eight micromole compounds, but the actual solubility fraction is only half, then you will get half of the site. We don't need to worry about this too much because in the next slides, we will see we tested in our orthogonal assays and this documentary uh, come to one to one. And of course, because of that setup, um, we do not need to apply such a high concentration in the buffer. So the next one is SPR, uh, and we are trying to uh, use the same system. And uh, this is again in this pseudo binary system means we try to saturate it one end and then to get the ternary thing. So you can see that the in the binary, they find the KD of this. And uh, I mean, because this is SPR, so you get another level of information from kinetics. And you can see that this is a, a, a half-life. Um, in the ternary, it's the KD becomes much smaller. I mean, those two KDs agree pretty well with the ITC I showed in the previous slides. The kinetics becomes slower. And what's most important is that this, uh, uh, it shows a very strong uh, positive collaborativity. Uh, in our in-house data, it's almost uh, like very consistent to uh, the, public case, uh, the, the publications. You can see the KD now, okay, so we have almost 100% bindings. It's one-to-one -one. and then the key off and everything. Um, so I hope in this way, uh, I convinced people that uh, we have validated our essays using the reported uh, targets and the tool compounds. And then the next job is to um, transfer this to our own project. Okay, so first is we want to see the binding between the VHL and our project A, which is the kinase. As the very first step, which is almost the same, is just to do the clean test on the binary on both ends. So VHL is behaved like really well uh, um, uh, oak, uh, on the uh, chip surface in SPR. So we can see that the KD is pretty much or uh, 10 animal or below. So this is a very, very tight end. On the other end to our target, uh, this, compound, uh, this uh, compound is just not so good. So you can see the KD is vaguely about uh, single digits, uh, double digits, micromole. But the most importantly is that the binding percentage is not that good. And we see a lot of artifacts. Again, we think this is because the compound is just not, uh, not really soluble in, in, in the buffer. So in this system, again, we have very tight end. And on the other hand, it's a, a loose and the compound doesn't behave well. So what is our options when designing the experiment? And one, option one will be just to immobilize our target protein and then try to use the saturated VHL and the compound complex. In this case, we might be able to push the system to a pseudo binary. Um, but the result is that we see very high and unstable background. That's likely due to the electrical uh, statics because we use the nickel, and the, uh, nickel chip at this part and the nickel chip is uh, positively charged. Um, that's just because this is a protein construct we have at hand and therefore it is not recommended. Uh, another option is that to uh, immobilize the VHL 
uh, and then uh, just use the, our protein and the protec as a uh, as a binder. And because of the uh, weak affinity between those two, so we expected to see a hook effect. As I mentioned before, usually for hook effect, we do a simulation and just to see how well it grow, agrees uh, with the experimental data. So if you think about the simulation of this system, it could be pretty complicated. It has three components. So each of them have a concentration. It has a KD between each one, each pair, uh, and there's a corroborativity. So six parameters in one equation, it is definitely doable because there's a publication on it. The equation could take a one and a half page. Um, so when we design it, think if there's any way to make it a little easier using approximation. So first the thing, because it is SPR is an immobilized method, so we don't need to worry um, the concentration of the protein that get immobilized. So that's good. Second is that, uh, especially for early phase of the drug discovery, the corroborativity is likely to be close to one. Then uh, the KD between the compound and the VHL, as I uh, show in the previous slide, they are all equally tied almost. So 10 animal is a good guess. Final thing about the protein concentration. This is limited. I mean, basically it's higher the better because you want to saturate on that end. But due to the limitation of this uh, method, usually the 10 micromole is the empirical uh, upper limit. So we try that. And therefore we just end up with two parameters. So suddenly it becomes pretty easy to do the simulation using just the very basic, uh, very basic equations. And here is the simulation. So we can see that, um, assume that we titrated the compounds and keep the uh, protein constant at 10 micromole and the KD between our compounds and the uh, targeted protein is unknown, but then we just simulated a few different cases. So if it is a one micromole, which is great, then we we'll expected to see a huge response and then the peak is somewhere around the one micromole. And of course, once this interaction becomes weaker and weaker, we expected to see the amplitude get uh, lower, but even up lower to like three micromole KD, we will still see a very decent response. I mean, it is about like 20 RU and given that's the uh, standard signal to noise is like two RU, so that's just no problem. If it's like a hundred micromole, that's probably will be challenging. So that's the simulation tell us. And then in the experiment, uh, started with the two control. So the control will be just the binds to one end, not the other. Okay, so those two compounds, one binds to VHL only, and this compound binds to our targeted protein only, and that's just a flat noise. Then uh, we applied the two uh, protec, and you can see that the shape and the, the, the place that it's peaked, and it's just agreed pretty well with our simulation, uh, and the amplitude indicated that the KD is probably around like 30 micromole, 50 micromole. And so in this way, I hope uh, uh, we convince the people that the SPR is successfully uh, uh, detected the formation of this complex in our own project. Now I'm going to switch to the Cerebra and a different project, which is a phosphatase. So given how successful Cerebra has been so far, uh, I assume that the affinity to the Cerebra and the warhead should be um, pretty tight. Uh, but the thing is that this protein is not easy to work in vitro. And uh, when we uh, try to, uh, uh, to develop this assay, I think uh, based on the uh, uh, reported literature by that time, the best contract is this, and it is not that good. And uh, uh, I will tell you later that because we found the affinity between the two is only like single digits micromole, so it is not great. If anyone that have a better construct amount, we will be more than happy to see if we can transfer uh, the solution to the uh, surface method. And then on the other hand, to our uh, uh, protein pro um, uh, phosphatase, it is very tight. It's a single digit nanomole. So therefore we just apply the very same trick. Um, this is a simulation. Uh, I mean, of course we have a two different ends. Now the shape of the curve looks very different from the previous, but it's still a very uh, apparent uh, hook effect and uh, um, depends on the affinity 
uh, between the cerebrum and the wart and, and the warheads, uh, we expected to see something like this. And uh, um, for the negative control, again, it's just a binding to one end, not the other. We see almost just the baseline. And our protec looks like this, and it seems to breed pretty well with the blue dots on the uh, simulation. So in this way, uh, I hope we also convince the people that uh, the cerebrum can also be uh, detected on the, uh, by SPR. The final slide is a summary of the BLI. So BLI um, is a similar idea as the um, uh, SPR. It is also a surface detection method. Um, it is, has its advantage because the setup is very easy and is not sensitive to uh, a lot of solution chemistry. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not as accurate uh, and uh, it can only detect the compound formation, not like compound and the small molecule uh, uh, interaction. So we tested again with this uh, 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 the VHL MZ1 BRD4 system. And the results is that uh, the KD is about a two to three nanomole. So it's a consistent to all what we have shown before. Uh, but I want to uh, point it out that the BLI is failed to show the hook effect. So therefore this is kind of like the, uh, the way that you can tell yes or no if the ternary complex are formed, but it cannot tell how much of the ternary complex are formed. Therefore, we suggest to use in this as the first step before you spend, uh, invest a lot of uh, time and resource on SPR. Okay, so just to quickly summarize what we have achieved here, we apply, uh, we validated the ITC, SPR, and the BLI uh, as an in vitro assay um, because they have uh, complemented uh, advantages. So we think this is a good set of the in vitro tools that to um, detect to characterize the formation of the ternary complex. And uh, um, I think that's it. I will stop here. This is the knowledge of uh, several members at the CDOT that give me help from the chemistry, from the uh, protein and the project A and B. And I will be more than happy to answer any questions.